Hello and welcome to a new series of Dinish Guarda YouTube podcast uh, series. And today, here in partnership with our major platforms, um, citiesabc.com, openbusinesscouncil.org, and freedomx.com, that you are going to hear in the future, we are going to be continuing profiling some of the leading personalities in the world that are changing the way we deal with our society, the, deal, the way we deal with businesses, and the way as well we deal with the concepts of narratives and stories. In this series, we've been profiling fantastic people and it's been a privilege to especially engage with some of the people that are very special because of their persistence, the resilience, but as well the capacity to inspire and create ventures, organizations, and as well lead um, big ventures and sometimes governments and countries. So today we're going to be touching one of the coolest and the hypest areas uh, that you can actually look when it comes to the digital creator economy. And I would say when we're talking about the internet at, at large and everything related from sports to business. And the, I welcome to our series, Jeff Wood, that is the co-founder and CEO of Metacurio. That is a fantastic platform that you're going to be profiling today. So Jeff Wood currently serves as the CEO and co-founder of Metacario, a full service Web 3.0 strategy company that works with global brands and talents that uh, want to get into this world of uh, fast growing and as well fast changing Web 3.0. Um, before that, he was a co-founder of Block Squared Capital, as well as the advisor to numerous uh, blockchain companies. And his passion for crypto led him to playing a major role in the ICO space in 2017 by starting a blockchain company in hopes of solving a real world problem of transparency in the charitable donation industry. And um, the background of uh, uh, Jeff and this company is quite impressive for both his expertise of 22 years over in technology and consulting, but working with some of the top companies in the world from uh, HCL Technologies and Zensar, and as well taking some companies public, a successful IPO and the exit from GSS Infotech. So I wanna touch, uh, especially with Jeff, uh, the work he's been doing with some of the global superstar personalities, both in sports, arts and architecture, and people like Mike Tyson and uh, actors and uh, renewed artists like Corey Van Liu, and as well, all the work that he's been doing uh, in terms of the cutting edge areas of NFTs, but as well bridging these kind of areas of creative economy, layers of Web 3.0, blockchain, and digital. So welcome to our series, Jeff. I could speak for hours, but you have a fantastic background. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Okay, just uh, one of the things I would like to start is, so you've been doing a lot of stuff, and uh, especially um, a lot of areas between the technology and big personalities and uh, and as well, making the bridge between these things. So how did this start with you? It was from childhood. It was how do you bridge things that are so different and how did this start in terms of your background? Well, honestly, I, I, I really never thought I would be doing what I do today for a living, especially with global celebrities that I grew up watching as a kid. Uh, so it's kind of a, a crazy experience, a little surreal. My background is actually kind of boring to how I ended up getting here. Uh, I started in software development in 1999, uh, kind of right at the beginning of Y2K. Uh, and out of Y2K really was born global outsourcing to a certain extent. That was when the Indian global outsourcing market kind of really expanded and became you know, the driving force that it is today. So I, was, I wanted to be a software developer. I wanted to actually be, I wanted to be you know, a VB developer back in the day. And I just thought that would be the greatest thing in the world. So I got into software um, and I ended up getting into operations and then sales. Uh, I did really, really well in software development. I ended up working specifically for Indian centric outsourcing companies, like I said, that were born out of Y2K uh, and spent 17 years uh, basically traveling back and forth to India. Uh, I lived in Hyderabad uh, as an executive uh, when we were doing an IPO for GSS Infotech. Uh, and then I ended up in Atlanta, Georgia uh, with my kids 
And around 2012, uh, I heard of this thing called Bitcoin. And that effectively changed my life forever after that. So, you know, after getting involved in Bitcoin, then it, uh, Ethereum came along. And then I, I realized the power of smart contracts, which uh, I think ultimately, you know, led to my fascination with cryptocurrency. And then once I started getting involved in Ethereum, you know, as an investor and, and just really as a passive participant, I really started to think about how this could help businesses and entrepreneurs and what were the all, all the possibilities. So I kind of drank the Kool-Aid, as they say, and then started getting involved in the ICO space. If you remember when Bitcoin made its bull run, you know, to 20,000, most people had not heard of Bitcoin. And then all of a sudden it was all over the media and people were doing token offerings and, you know, everyone was doing an ICO. Well, I was heavily involved in that. So I was on a plane every 10 days to a different country for about two years. Uh, it was a very uh, amazing and interesting time in my life. I was in Seoul, Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, Tokyo, London, Zurich, uh, pretty much just hopping all over the globe, living in permanent jet lag, either speaking about practical applications of blockchain, tokenizing projects. Uh, I was advising uh, offerings, uh, just completely caught up in this entire world of cryptocurrency and leveraging uh, tokens as, a, as another uh, capital source for projects. So we ended up setting up an office in Central and Hong Kong and started deploying capital into media and tech. Uh, I kind of got involved in private equity for a little while uh, and venture capital. And during that process, you know, we were doing pretty well. We started deploying capital into media projects in Los Angeles. At that time, I met a woman by the name of Sophie Watts. Sophie's uh, very well known for being one of the only females to ever co-found or start a movie studio called STX Entertainment. And STX is, uh, uh, at the time when she exited, was worth about two and a half billion. They, you know, they made Bad Moms. They made Hustlers with Jennifer Lopez you know, a pretty significant size studio in Los Angeles. I met Sophie and we became venture partners and friends. And then I ended up moving to Los Angeles. So at that time, my life was still pretty, other than the whole crypto craziness, was still not uh, dealing with celebrities every day. And then Sophie called me last year and said, hey, I have all of these celebrities call me about NFTs and you're my crypto guy. You, you, you know what NFTs are. And how can we do something in this space? And I remember really significantly, this was right when NFTs started to become culturally relevant in the media, especially you know, in North America. You had Gronk, Patrick Mahomes, you know, Paris Hilton did her, her big drop. Uh, and they were getting a lot of exposure. People, everyone was talking about NFTs. So we originally toyed around with the idea of creating a platform you know, like an open sea or an eternity or a mintable, but having lived through all of the craziness of crypto in 2017 and seeing the fragments of how fragmented the actual um, crypto market was in the exchange market, I said, let's create a creative agency. Um, let's not compete with institutional money trying to create platforms. Let's create a creative agency and effectively sell picks and shovels, right? So during a gold rush, that's usually a safe bet. So I kind of felt that that was the case. So again, I took a, I took a different approach than most of my peers. Uh, we didn't invest in technology first. We invested in legal. Uh, the reason we invested in legal first was because if, you have, if you're familiar at all with the entertainment industry, every piece of IP or every, you know, every celebrity or talent has a circle of agents, managers, and lawyers that just circle around their whole ecosystem. So knowing that, because I had dabbled in entertainment already, I knew that we would have to go through a huge amount of red lines and contract negotiations to acquire IP. And that most of my friends or my competitors wouldn't be thinking like that. They'd be focused on developing smart contracts and platforms. Uh, and I wanted to acquire IP. So we spent really the first six months of our business just doing a land grab you know, just papering up contracts with some of the biggest brands and names in the world. Mike Tyson being our, our first customer, 
then, you know, Dennis Rodman, Wesley Snipes, the Joe Frazier estate, um, Odell Beckham Jr., Albert Einstein, Charlie Chaplin, the Wright brothers. Um, so we just kept layering more IP and more IP. Um, we went through a capital raise, we raised a seed round. And then it was interesting because then I had all these investors and all these IP and people now were like, okay, you have to actually, you know, you got to drop an NFT now, Jeff, because you've raised money and you've got all this IP, but we have to actually do something. So our first customer that we launched was Mike Tyson. And uh, we did the Mike Tyson, Corey Van Lu collaboration, which if, if you're familiar with the NFT space was wildly popular. Um, I think it was a mix of right time, right place, but also I feel like I had a very specific opinion and stuck to it. And I think sometimes in business, you have to be willing to just do that. You know, I, uh, having spent a decade in crypto and considering myself part of this community, uh, I really focused on bringing Mike into the space in kind of the most organic and authentic way possible, partnering with an up and coming artist. You know, Corey went on to do amazing things at Sotheby's and, you know, has become a, a blue chip world-class artist in his own right. But, you know, Corey was just really starting to get popular when we partnered with him for Mike. And I don't think people expected us to take Mike Tyson and do color palette of pink and blue. Uh, so it was against the norm. You know, everybody was doing really low hanging, obvious kind of sports card stuff. And we took a more artistic approach with Mike. We ended up doing a uh, million dollars in sales in the first 30 minutes. Uh, and then... We woke up the next day and, and something crazy had happened. Uh, we had done over 15 million in secondary sales and we none of us expected that. And it was really a testament to the power of the NFT community in the market, right? In the, uh, the, the consumption of collectors for content. A, a lot of videos got made of people buying NFTs from Mike's collection for $900 and selling them for $30,000 the same day. So uh, a bunch of those videos went viral on TikTok, you know, kids, teenagers, 20 year old kids buying something for a thousand dollars and then paying off their college tuition the next day. Um, so it was really a, as an entrepreneur, it was a fun to be part of that entire process. So then we dropped another collection for Mike, did a million dollars in 23 minutes, the laser eyes derivative. And now we're on Mike's fourth drop. We built a trading card game for him on Solana called Iron Pigeons. We're doing a drop on Binance with them. And then we started dropping other collections for other clients, uh, Paradigm Sports. Uh, we did a drop for, we created our own blockchain racing company called Reactor Motors, sold almost 9,000 NFTs in four days, gave away a custom McLaren 570S supercar to one of the community members. Um, we just did a charity drop for Ukraine with Vladimir Klitschko and Wisby, the artist. Um, we just dropped a collection for authentic brand groups for Terry O'Neill. Um, we're dropping Dennis Rodman later this month. So we're, we're heavily involved in the space. I think we're going on our 10th drop now, which is a lot considering we just launched the company last March. We went through two rounds of funding. Um, we have a, I'm very fortunate. I have a very uh, interesting cap table full of, you know, high profile entertainment entrepreneurs um, Lionel Richie led our second round. Uh, if you're familiar with him, probably one of the, you know, the greatest singers and songwriters of the 20th century by far. Um, and he's been a great inspiration as a business partner and a mentor for sure. So my kind of goal now that we've, you know, established some credibility and some case studies, you know, now we're working with brands is for me is to push web three forward in the, the most authentic way possible. Uh, to expand the community uh, and to help bring brands and talent into the space in a way that doesn't punish or hurt collectors. That's my biggest fear. You know, there's, when you have a market that becomes, you know, uh, that grows hyper fast, uh, you have the potential for people to be opportunistic and take advantage of buyers, right? We saw that in crypto time and time again. So I think you're seeing that now in the NFT space with a lot of projects which are just coming out, which effectively are, are white paper ICOs to a certain extent. There's really no meat behind them. So we like to focus on utility, community, um, the ability to 
you know, create value long term, not just in the value of the collectible, but the value of the community, like the value to you as a collector, like getting access to different levels of content, paywall, token gating. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing now and, and growing faster than I could ever imagine. I think I now... I pretty much talk to at least some celebrity at least once a day now. And I, and I'm, I'm like, how, how is this my life to be quite honest with you? Uh, so it's fun. It's fun. No, that's impressive. First of all, congratulations because you brought some of the biggest celebrities to the industry. And as well, like you said, I think uh, it's not easy to do what you're doing. And I think it's, I think people looking at the NFTs, everyone thinks is a fan and things are going to destroy in five minutes, but it's about uh, the new layer of the web 3.0. So, so can you, for people that never heard, and I have a lot of questions, but can you explain what is Metacurio and how you work? I think that's interesting for people listening to us. And you mentioned, of course, the global superstars that you're working with, but I think it would be interesting to understand how an agency like yours works, because my audience, of course, is uh, I'm actually talking a lot about these areas, but uh, I think the devil's on details. So I think if you could just highlight, and it, it's a very new because you said it's less than one year. So it's actually quite impressive. Yeah, I mean, we're kind of a one-stop shop for brands and talents that want to enter Web3. I mean, ultimately what your the problem major brands and major talent stars face is they see an emerging market, they want to enter that market, but they don't have any clue how, especially when it's a tech-driven market like NFTs or Web3. So they'll see their peers making, you know, either lots of money or lots of noise, or they'll start to see their peers laying a foundation for the future. Uh, and they're like, how do we get into that space? You know, logically, they have to search, they're, they're searching for domain experts, right? Experts in the field. And you, when you have a very brand new market, there's not a lot of those. You know, I never like to call myself an expert or anything, but I have practical application. I have practical knowledge, right? And that takes experience. Even if it's only a year, there's only a handful of organizations that have dropped 10 major collections in the last year in this space. It's just a small community. So when celebrities and, and brands contact us, we handle everything. We kind of shepherd them into the space from helping create and design their entry into Web3, if that's an NFT collection or a metaverse experience we help bring in the artist. We help create the syndication model. We do all of the crypto native marketing, which is very important because marketing in Web3 is not the same thing as marketing in traditional media. You know, we market directly to the community. We are very uh, focused and, and involved in Twitter and working with collectors and buyer curation. And I don't like the word influencers, but people in the space that have a platform and have a voice and have credibility. We work directly with companies like NFT Now, which I think is doing amazing things to push Web3 forward. And we work with a lot of people who are early adopters to create marketing and integration strategies for these products. Then we hold the hand of the talent and the brand all the way through that process. We help design the smart contracts, whether they're on Solidity or Rust for Solana. We do the entire syndication model in the, in the sense of, are we going to mint this on our own standalone page? Are we going to partner with a distribution platform like OpenSea or OneOf or Eternity? And then how, after we distribute this, how are we going to support the community? Are we going to handle the Discord? Are we going to handle all the community management? So we do all of that and we take a success fee. So we do take a certain amount of risk as well because we deploy capital uh, along every stage of the way and we only collect uh, fees if the project is successful. So it's a it's definitely uh, an exciting but highly detailed oriented business. I think a lot of people look at the NFT market now and are like, oh, hey, I can just go get someone on Fiverr to make me some art and then I can throw up a smart contract and become a millionaire. That absolutely can happen. I mean, that's but those are anomalies. Those are not replicatable or scalable. And what I like to focus on things that are scalable and replicatable. So, you know, we have a full service business. We have uh, development, graphics, creative, design, account management, marketing, PR, every aspect of that distribution cycle in, in the kind of NFT lifecycle and Web3 integration we can handle. Uh, and we work with not just talent, but now we're working directly with brands. You know, brands entering the space and saying, hey, the same thing, you know, 
for instance, you know, when Adidas did their collab and when, you know, Louis Vuitton or Gucci or anyone enters the space, they have to go out and find someone to help shepherd them into the space. So we know that over the next five years, and I'm a, a true believer that every single person uh, at some point in every single brand is going to play or be involved in the digital goods space or the metaverse over the next five years. And it's because we all have one of these, right? Everyone has a phone and it's a logical evolution to move forward uh, and leveraging those phones to interact. So we're trying to set up a foundation so that as we grow and more brands want to enter the space, they can come find a trusted partner like us to help guide them through all of this. Very impressive and congratulations. So, so you mentioned that you work with Sophie Watts. Uh, and of course, people can look at metacorio.com and you're going to put it here. So I would like to touch. So one of the things that I think it's important, like you said, there's Rex to reach his stories, but in the end of the day, it's about really, like you said, in the, in the golden run, it was the shovels and it was actually the work that people did really to, to build the tools that people use and to fail, especially to scale it, that is the key element for the scalability of this. So one of the first, one of the questions I have for you is, okay, bear in mind this kind of knowledge that you have both from digital to blockchain, to crypto, and as well to right now working with artists and working with people like Sophie Watts, that is a, a global media executive that has experience in dealing with the artists. So um, for the artists listening to us or for the creators, what would be, kind of the advice you would give them bear in mind all the kind of um, experience that you've been having of course working with global superstars but as well taking them from their comfort zones to bring into their space because that is, one thing is like Mike Tyson experience in boxing and as well as media personality the other thing is right now doing NFTs and like you said it needs a lot of artistic approach so I would like to touch this because it's a, it's a question a lot of artists ask me myself and they come to me a bit in panic. Okay, should I trust this? Should I do this? How can I do this? And I think that is the area that you guys are doing a fantastic work. I think it's important for creators <clears throat> and creators can be brands or individuals and uh, they can be artists or they can just be people that want to create content. You know, I think it's important for creators to enter Web3 uh, and I'll, I'll use this word a lot, the most authentic way possible because you have an opportunity in this creator economy to actually have control of your economic, you know, uh, linear path. Like in, in the way things were before, you know, a creator creates something and then goes and finds three or four middlemen to participate in selling that blah, blah, blah. And the bulk of that money might get dispersed amongst all of that ecosystem of people. But in web three, that's not the case, you know, um, for talent, I would say just, just take a step in that direction uh, and be, be okay with failing, to be quite frank. I think that a lot of, you know, and I deal with this all the time because global superstars call me and they're like, hey, we want to enter, we want to do an NFT drop. And we saw that so-and-so made $4 million and we want to make $4 million. And I'm like, don't worry about the $4 million. Worry about entering the space in a way that actually integrates you with the community and starts a narrative and a conversation actually care about the people that are in the community and they will reward you exponentially right if you can get the support of the community uh, and that's by just being authentic creating good art uh, selling stuff that has value creating utility for the people in the space not just doing a cash grab not just trying to make a dollar off the back of someone in this space and actually trying to create value uh, then you can come back to this space 10, 15, 20 times, 100 times. And over a long period of time, you can aggregate $100 million. Like there's an endless amount of opportunity here. You look at stars like Steve Aoki and even Snoop Dogg, they have dropped so much stuff, so much content, but the community loves them, right? Because they're, they're hyper-involved. They're involved in conversations, in narrative, in promotion, in moving the space forward, in, in highlighting artists and giving a voice to, uh, you know, new creators. Like, those are the things that you need to do. I have, <clears throat> I have a friend who's a college professor of art, <clears throat> and she'll call me and say, Jeff, how do I get into NFTs? You know, I'm a traditionally classic trained artist. I, I'm a professor at a college, and I see these 18 and 19-year-old kids making millions of dollars in digital art. How do, how do I enter this space? 
And I told her, just enter, like just create art, uh, do the same thing you do in the physical world and, you know, mint that and, and enter the space and get involved in the community. Start having conversations on Twitter and get involved in Twitter spaces. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't take anything more than that, but I think people are scared of these small barriers to entry. Uh, but I mean, I would say to any creator listening that listens to this, you know, take a risk on yourself, right? Because the people that don't get involved in Web3 are just going to sit on the sidelines and say, oh, I wish I had done that, right? And we've already seen that in the last year. People are like, oh, why didn't I mint a board ape? Why didn't I mint a crypto punk? You know, uh, I know, that, you know, so many of my friends heard about those and didn't do it. So just take a risk, you know, uh, Web3 is a beautiful place for creators. Uh, the creator economy is a real thing. I also think the people that are going to benefit the most from Web3 are not superstars. I'm going to be very clear about that. That's my business. I'm very good at that. And I like that and I enjoy it. But the future of Web3 and the creator economy is lower level creators, right? It's enabling people who have a following of, let's call it, you know, a thousand or 2000 or 3000 people on Instagram or on Twitter or TikTok to be able to monetize their fan base in a way that adds value to their total economy, right? You couldn't do that before. Like if, if I was a creator with 5,000 Instagram followers, maybe I have a podcast, maybe, you know, I could go to Patreon or something else, right? But it doesn't have the same ability to grow as fast as a Web3 integration. I can sell NFTs now as an independent artist for different aspects, and I can keep all of that, that money truly without having to go through a middleman because of smart contracts, because of decentralized platforms. You know, OpenSea only charges 2.5% of a fee. So if the creator then can keep 97.5% of all of those proceeds, right? That's, that's a huge opportunity. And you can create NFTs that create value for your community, premium content, paywall content, without having to go through a centralized authority, you know, like a YouTube, like a Spotify, like a Patreon, which is going to keep a large portion of your funds, which should not happen. You as the creator should benefit from your work. And I think that you're going to see a huge influx of what we call micro level influencers and creators over the next two years uh, that are going to be hugely rewarded from getting involved in Web3. I, I love your vision and I believe that that is the way to go. So, so I want to touch a bit of practicalities here because I think it's important to understand from the, the top level to the middle level. And especially what you said is very inspiring. But it's not easy. Like you said, there's a lot of failure and, and a test and the error, and that most of people give up. I think that's the challenge with the, with the Web 3.0 is that definitely the numbers tell about 50 million creators worldwide. These 50 million creators mostly have a combined economy of over $100 billion. And from this $100 billion, if you put on the top of this, the gig economy is $1 trillion, which is a huge chunk of the world economy. But most of these people are not making any money. Who makes money out of this is, is the likes of the centralized platforms we have in the world economy, which there's nothing wrong about it. They did a lot of work to do. Some of them have more wrongs than rights, but I think it's not the point. So I would like to touch one question for you is, <clears throat> as a, an ambassador and as well as one of the leaders of the Web 3.0, how do you think we can actually have these platforms? Because at the moment we have a bit of a schizophrenic world between the the highly centralized players like the Facebooks and the Googles and, and the Microsofts and Apples and Netflix. And then we have all these new platforms like OpenSea that are becoming massive as well. And they have millions of dollars of sales per month. And a lot of other platforms like Nifty Gateway and so forth and some of the other ones that you mentioned. So how do you see this work in parallel? Because I think the challenge is, are we going to have a decentralized app, a web 3.0 that of course all the people like us somehow want, but we need some kind of governance and how these platforms can actually work with the other ones. Because for instance, yesterday or recently this week, and for people listening to us today is the 17th of March, 2022, but uh, for instance, Mark Zuckerberg just announced that Instagram is going to have NFTs. So, and as well, Twitter recently launched as well, the first NFT solutions. So how do you see these kind of more mainstream global powerhouses with the new ones that you just mentioned, OpenSea, Nifty Gateway, Rarible, and so forth. And you mentioned Solana as well, that is doing a fantastic work on this world, in these areas. If I was Google or 
if I was Facebook or Twitter, I'd be worried because I do not think the future, uh, I do not think my grandchildren's future, you know, 20, 30 years down the road from now is in centralized, you know, hubs of technology controlled by three or four companies. I think it is a decentralized economy. Uh, I think Web3 is not just a fairy tale. I think it's a practical, you know, evolution of uh, technology and economies and culture. So we're definitely going to see a lot of mainstream companies try to grab onto something. In a, and, and Instagram is a perfect example of that. Obviously, Facebook changed its name to Meta. Facebook is a global powerhouse, not only just from its reach, but R&D, which people forget about. You're talking about billions and billions of dollars applied to research and development every year. So a lot of forward thinking engineers and scientists over there creating solutions. And uh, but I think that, you know, Facebook can launch an NFT platform for Instagram. I don't I'm sure it will do well at some level of retail facing purchases. But will it will it dethrone uh, OpenSea or some of the new decentralized exchanges coming on? I, I absolutely not. Uh, Twitter has become and in many ways reinvented itself as crypto Twitter. I think the best thing that happened to Twitter was NFTs because now, you know, I mean, I, I've been using Twitter for a long time. I'm a big fan of the platform, but it was definitely losing out on relevance in the last three years and the users. And now effectively, if you're in Web3, you're on Twitter. That is where the conversation is taking place. And now, you know, they're rolling out va validated PFPs. And then, you know, Twitter spaces have become this huge hub for conversation, which effectively replaced Clubhouse in a lot of ways for these conversations. Um, I think all of these big platforms are going to create things, but I don't think they're going to they're going to be able to compete with truly decentralized creator economies. It just at the end of the day, every centralized authority is in is a, a company is in the business of just making money for themselves and their shareholders, which is fine. I'm a capitalist, too, but that's not going to be as powerful as a decentralized platform that's in the business of rewarding the creators. Right where the creators have the ability to not only reward themselves, but to grow the community. There's definitely some downsides to uh, decentralized platforms. So I'm, you know, I'm not a cult member, right? Like I don't, I don't just believe it completely. There's, there's downsides. I mean, when you, you can look at OpenSea as an example, and I love that platform. I'm a partner with them. Um, but because it's decentralized, anybody can upload anything, right? So you have a huge issue with, unauthorized collections and you know we deal with that every time we drop a collection lots of fake collections pop up because anyone can can upload anything you're gonna uh, have 70 percent, i think of the uploads yeah it's... absolutely and and that's because if you give every single person the ability to upload anything in a decentralized authority then people are going to abuse that unfortunately so governance and quality control you know those things uh can Technology can help address some of those, but it's always going to be kind of an issue. And I see a lot of, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations. DAO is a big word that gets thrown around now. I see a lot of that uh, happening and getting involved. And I think governance is a great idea. We're involved in some projects that handle governance. I'm part of a DAO called Buckets DAO. Uh, so I think that there's opportunities for all those things, but we are still very much at the beginning, right? So we're going to as a community that's Web3, we're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna create technology. We're gonna implement solutions. And we're gonna to have to kind of stumble through some of these issues until we find the complete right solution. But the right solution is not the creator getting screwed. I can promise you that. The right solution is a creator economy where the creator uh, is able to make money and build uh, their own economic value and grow without having to have you know, the bulk of their money go to some centralized uh, company. Yeah, and, uh, and I think it's, uh, I, I completely subscribe to what you said, but it's not easy <laughs> because at the moment, this is moving so fast that even people like us sometimes get uh, get very confused. So so I, I'm we have around one hour, so we are in the 40 minutes first. So I want to touch one thing, and I think I would like to use the case study of Mike Tyson. So you touched it a bit, but I think it's important for people listening to us how someone like Mike Tyson created the new kind of revenue stream, let's put it that way, but he created as well something really cool that is the work that he's been doing, of course, under your um, uh, work.
that is the 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 um, the, the work has been working actually partly with the uh, with the creative part that is the um, with Corey Van Liu in terms of launching the unique collection of iconic moments. Um, so I would like to to talk about this case study because I think it's interesting to see, of course, Tyson as a huge name, but as well how he had to reinvent himself in this world. And I would like if you can share with us, I think, some of the process because I, I always like to go to the layers, and I think that it might be interesting for global artists listening to us. Uh, and this channel, we are privileged that we are right now one uh, one thousand eight hundred in the world in terms of tech uh, YouTube channels. But I would like to make sure mostly the layers that took you to convince Mike Tyson to work with him, to work with the artists and create this. Of course, not all the details, but top level. Oh, but yeah. Sure. And, and Mike is Mike's brilliant. Mike's actually uh, one of the most articulate and interesting people that I've met in my in, in entire life. Uh, a wealth of uh, of knowledge in that man's brain. Uh, he's really, really, really brilliant. So when we started talking about Mike entering the space, you know, I just really kind of went with my gut and said that I don't want Mike to enter the space in a way that's going to do anything other than set his brand up for success long term. So there was a lot of talk about dropping like trading cards around boxing and, you know, like boxing glove collectibles and, you know, in the form of an NFT, which would have been very low hanging fruit. And my opinion with Mike and every client is always that you can be a pioneer in this space. You just have to be willing to take a risk. Right. Um, so Mike's always been, uh, you know, at the head of everything that he does in his career. So, you know, we did an artist search. That's where it started. We started reaching out and looking for artists, looking through portfolios, we probably went through a hundred artists before we decided on Corey Van Lu. Corey Van Lu, uh, that that kid is amazing. Like you know, he was making street art a few years ago, and now he's at Sotheby's. Like, what kind of greater dream can you have? Like, that's the that's the ultimate dream. I think he even sold one of his paintings, and I could be wrong, but I remember seeing a picture of a street painting that he that he that he left at his mom's or something, and just sold at Sotheby's. Like, that's crazy. So. And he's a brilliant uh, artist. He is passionate. He also happened to be a huge Mike Tyson fan. So everything kind of worked together. And then Mike and Corey started collaborating on what this art could look like. You know, my company's job is always to sit behind the creator and to help facilitate the process. You know, the stars of these projects are the, are the artists and the celebrities, really. You know, and we really put a lot of focus on Corey in that project because you know, I thought that Corey brought something really unique to that entire equation. His color palette uh, is amazing, you know, and no one expected to see Mike in that. And, and Corey took these iconic moments and brought them to life in an artistic way that no one really expected. So it was a lot of back and forth and iteration and design. And then, you know, Mike was very helpful in the entire marketing process. He had a lot of great ideas. Uh, and then we worked with him on integrating him into the crypto community. You know, he was collecting NFTs. He was talking to people in the community, you know, getting involved, having an opinion, starting a dialogue around Solana or Ethereum and, and really, you know, taking a, a position of, you know, wanting to be in crypto and in NFTs. And that's kind of goes back to that authentic integration that I talked about with these uh, with these celebrities. I don't think people should just show up and be like, here's my stuff, buy it. I think people should get involved in the community and then organically, you know, have a product that people want to collect or buy. So uh, it was a, it was a, it was a lot of work. I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into not just designing the art. Obviously I'm not the artist, Corey Van Lu's the genius there, but designing the syndication model. What do we price these things at? How do we market it? How many pieces do we do? You know, how long do we run it for? Do we do an auction? Do we do a buy now? We did a one of one piece for Mike, um, which a gentleman from Dubai bought for almost $300,000, a single piece that unlocked uh, uh, an experience with Mike in person, uh, boxing lesson. That uh, Charles is actually coming to uh, LA in a few weeks, actually, I think next week, to actually meet with Mike and not only uh, have that experience, but uh, there was a Corey did a physical painting of the NFT as well. So Charles gets to pick that up. So all of those little things go into making a successful drop. But I think the most important thing is, you know, amazing art and having the, the talent or celebrity actually care about the community and get involved. Mike's done a great job there. 
Uh, I mean, again, I think I'm just that guy behind the scenes. I think that the real stars of those projects, you know, are the celebrity and the artist. Oh, you're quite humble because that's not an easy task to do what you guys did. So I, I want to touch um, another another area of your work that I think is really cutting edge and is kind of different because, of course, one thing is global celebrities like Mike Tyson and you have uh, as well uh, Rodman and so forth and a lot of others that I'm sure I just go to the web, for people listening to us, just go to the website. But I want to touch about the reactor motors drop. Which is this kind of very cool because you are actually dealing now not all not with the kind of conventional global celebrities that is much easier somehow to sell but here we're talking about um reactive motors that is um of course a, a car and the universe related with the community of automobile but uh, what you guys did out of this is really impressive so i would like to to touch this for people listening to us um it's not just uh, in this case a list uh personalities but as well here uh, we talk about engineering how to mobile in the world and creating our collectives and really cool things out of this yeah reactor motors is an interesting case study in creating a brand from scratch you know reactor motors didn't exist a year ago so that's also the beautiful thing of this market is you have the ability to do that in a in a very quick time so i had a client that had uh that had come to me with this mclaren 570s supercar and he was like how can we do something in nfts around this it was actually designed to look like iron man uh mike had it you know customized wrapped had an actual reactor stuck in the hood of the car it looks just like iron man um i actually have the matching motorcycle in my living room right in front of me and so when mike came to me he's like how can we do this so we collaborated on building an actual you know, uh, blockchain racing game, you know, uh, called React and building this brand called Reactor Motors. So we spent six months, you know, creating a, a backstory, a narrative, designing the overall drop of these reactors, which then were revealed into cars, which are now being uh, deployed into an actual play to earn blockchain racing game. Uh, we also gave away that car, uh, that 570S McLaren supercar to one of the community members as part of the drop activation which was crazy because someone bought an NFT for $150 and ultimately got a McLaren supercar. Uh, and we actually just, they just came and picked that up probably two weeks ago. So the couple came to LA, we paid for them and all their travel and they transferred the car to them. Uh, but that was also a great, the whole process there was a great, less, uh, great lesson for us and how to build community. I think we have almost 5,000 unique wallet holders in that community now very active discord we sold almost 9,000 nfts in four days uh that also taught us about the power of you know not only community but marketing right like how do you successfully market these projects to the right buyers how do you successfully get in touch with the right collectors what's the right price point how to create value uh how do you facilitate a roadmap and then execute on that roadmap long term and we still have plenty of things to do in Reactor Motors as a community, but it's growing, you know, very quickly. Uh, we'll be announcing our partnership on the game, I think, in the next few months. Then we'll roll out that game. Our goal always was to, like, take a community like Zed Run, which has done an amazing thing for horse racing and crypto uh, and NFTs, and apply that to kind of supercars and custom vehicles. I didn't realize... Uh, when we built this community, how involved the actual car culture aspect of it would be in the community. People go into the Discord and share pictures of their own cars, and it's become pretty of a, a hub or a central location for these community members to go and just talk about the things they love, which are cars. Again, that goes back to this concept of community, right? Um, and React, the greatest thing about Reactor Motors is when people ask me about that, I'm like, yeah, that literally did not exist. Uh, 12 months ago, like we just completely created that brand built, you know, sold almost $3 million worth of product in four days. And now are launching a blockchain racing game that'll probably generate 10 to $15 million this year in revenue. And we'll continue to push back value and rewards to the community so we can grow that community and turn it into a real global brand. That's impressive. And congratulations. So I, I know that we are uh... Uh, I don't know if you have a bit li a limit on, on, on one hour, but I have one uh, a couple of questions. So let's see if we can wrap up. So one of the questions I want is, okay, we're talking about the NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And I think this is right now the big thing of 2021 and 22, let's put it that way. 
but now we have this thing, the metaverse. You touch a bit the meta. So how do you see, because I'm actually, well, disclosure, I'm actually building a metaverse platform myself, but one of the things I will want your opinion is, so from the web 3.0, actually my new book tells that, well, at least that's what I put it, that uh, the, the NFTs are the key for the web 3.0 and the metaverse or metaverses are the doors. So how do you see this confluence of uh, these kind of platforms that are immersive, not in the sense of VR, but in the sense of putting this? Because I think in a, in a kind of metaverse platforms, everything you're doing gets 10 times more power. Because in the end of the day, if we have platforms that are interactive, that are more immersive, we can create a lot of things. So I would like to have your views on metaverse and um, on the things that are working, because of course the central land is already creating fantastic benchmarks, even with small, um, not a lot of uh, people, but the numbers are quite impressive. And I actually just sharing some numbers with our audience, because uh, I like to look at the numbers, but it's really very impressive. If you look uh, for people listening to us, uh, the numbers are amazing, but at the same time, uh, almost scary. So just for people listening to us, so the central land has 300,000 monthly active users and only 18,000 around 18, well, not only, but 18 daily active users, but has a valuation of three to $5 billion. And it has effectively around 300 to $500 million of tokens being traded per day. And in the case of Sandbox is half a million connected wallets, very important, and uh, has raised $93 million, but it has a valuation of $14 billion. So this is already a huge business. And I think this platform, especially for people listening to us, the central land had JP Morgan with an office there on X, that is a lounge. Um, HSBC just uh, highlighted actually yesterday or this week that they're going to be opening their own lounge. And of course, I would say all the brands will have this. And you mentioned Adidas, uh, that was a drop very successful in NFT. So how do you see this world, especially with everything that you have in your portfolio? So I feel like we already kind of live in the metaverse. So I feel like we have been for a while, but it's becoming popular in media, this term. Uh, you know, the power of Web3 is how we consume and how we deliver content, right? At least that's fundamentally what I look at it like. And NFTs are part of that solution stack. Uh, when we talk about metaverse activations or metaverse components or getting involved in the metaverse, taking, you know, a physical reality and creating a digital duplicate or creating an immersive experience, I think we're going to see more and more of that. I also don't think that it all has to be tied to Decentraland or Sandbox. Uh, I'm, I think those platforms are great. I fully support them uh, and happy to work with them with my clients. But you're going to have the ability for you know, global superstars or brands to create their own metaverse experience based off of their own domain, right? I mean, obviously, you know, when you look at like Nike or Adidas or some of these giant global brands, Red Bull, whoever, they obviously can create a, an entire metaverse experience directly off of their own property and build their own experience and add value and significance to their users. I, I definitely think you're going to see more and more of that. We're working with uh, a lot of talent that says, hey, we want to create digital galleries, digital museums. We want to create effectively a digital replica, uh, replication of what's inside someone's brain in the metaverse. So fans can experience, you know, historical events, emotional connections, immersive experiences, and NFTs are tied to that as token gating or paywalls or premium content experiences. Uh, you're definitely going to see more of that. You're also going to see more uh, worlds being created where effectively metaverse uh, real estate and houses and assets become astronomically valuable. There's zero doubt about that. If, if I was a kid today, I would get into to, to designing in Unreal or in some of the other digital tools because uh, there's going to be a huge demand for digital galleries for sure in the next three to five years. And if you go to places like the Gulf, I was just in Dubai. There's going to be a huge, you're going to see people that set up physical businesses um, that are selling digital real estate or digital property from physical locations, which is kind of funny, but that's definitely going to happen for sure. Uh, I'm a fan. You know, I also think that the technology still needs to catch up a little, you know, to be fully immersive, obviously AR, VR, as you see more things like Apple glasses come on in the next year or two as, you know, Oculus and other, um, VR tools become, 
you know, less cumbersome, you know, and we start to have really mass adoption because it's, there's less barriers to physical, you know, entry. I play with Oculus. I have one. Uh, I play with AR VR, but there's still, we're still the hardware still a couple cycles behind where it needs to be. And then when you log into these immersive experiences online, you know, I think they're really, really cool. I would much rather have a zoom or a conversation in an immersive world where people could actually show me things and walk around and explore than just in a static, you know, situation. So I'm very bullish on that. I think it's it's a great, exciting moment. And I think, like you said, if you're not on this, you'll definitely get out of the run. Um, so I know that you're cautious of time. So I want just to probably to wrap up and uh, if you have more time. So for people coming to, let's say, if if there's people listening to us, they want to approach MetaCore. So you only work with big collaborations or it's more about the talent that you like. How is your process? Because I think I always we like work with. Better. We work with a mix. I do work, I mean, with primarily global uh, brands and talent, but I also work with a lot of independent talent. Two of my favorite clients are independent artists who have, you know, not huge followings because I believe that the power of this creator economy is in, you know, uh, creators at the beginning of their life cycle and micro and nano influencers. So anyone can go to metacurio.com and reach out and contact us. You know, I'm, I'm heavily involved in the space just from a community interaction standpoint. We obviously at, are at pretty much all the events, you know, meeting and talking to people. Um, so it's, it's absolutely not hard to reach out to us. And I'm always happy to answer questions as well, you know, from anyone in the community. I probably get hit up uh, on Twitter, you know, 10, 15 times a day from people asking questions. And I'm always happy when I have time to answer any questions that is going to help push the NFT or Web3 community forward. Fantastic. Thank you for your um, generosity and as well impact here. So I, I think I have a lot of more questions, but I want to be respectful of your time. So Jeff, it's been a privilege to be here in this 60 minutes talking about the ex excellent work. For people listening to us, we're going to put all the links to Jeff websites and social media platforms. We're going to put as well a lot of information about the, the NFT drops that was done. I think please go to the website research because this is amazing cutting edge work, but as well the knowledge and the efforts they put on that. There's a lot of documentation, links to, to PRs and documentation that I think everyone should look and involve. I, I don't know if there's any, any last thing you want to show with our audience. I would appreciate that. No, I think we're good. It's been really, really enjoyable. I've appreciated the time and, and, and it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much, Jeff. I wish you a good luck for everything and uh, continuous success. Thank you very much. You have a great day. Thank you.